Hi, everybody. Yeah, it's Leonie Lee here. Thanks for joining me. It's, it's a great opportunity to present to uh, the horse community about the greater insights of what horse architecture can be and what it can offer our, our wonderful animals. Uh, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart as an architect and a, an equestrian and bringing those two passions together to create environments that horses can thrive in but ultimately to educate the horse community on how we can create positive experiences, day-to-day -day positive experiences for our horses in all types of constructed environments. And I'm talking everything from your paddock shelters to your stables and your covered arenas and all the spaces in between. Because I guess we're so concerned about what our horses do and and how and what they eat and their rugs and how they're trained and what their appearance is like. But I guess the focus that is sometimes missing is about where they are. And what I mean is where they spend their time, where they spend their time 20 hours a day, whether it's in small paddocks with shelters, in stables, where they train and, and how we take them through those routines in the built environment and how that can really help with how they're handled and trained and performed as well as their overall welfare. Now, I find it, it's really interesting uh, from my perspective as an architect that despite how much time horses spend in and out about the built environment, it's one of the least scrutinised aspects of keeping horses. And so I guess it, it's our job at Equitecture to try and raise the awareness of some of the common problems associated with traditional stabling practices and what are the key benefits of looking at something from an evidence-based science research. And so our uh, work is primarily looking at applying science in, a, in an architectural lens and creating the best environment, just so that horses physically and mentally can thrive. So I'll move on. We're going to be recapping a little bit on what we looked at last uh, webinar. Uh, and just to give you an overall introduction to who we are, so we are essentially about improving the welfare of the horse. And what we find is because there's no common standard worldwide of horse facility design, and this is everything from insulation values to space requirements um, to horse keeping and management, it's a, a really a new field that we're looking at investigating and bringing our knowledge of architecture into the, the lives of the horses, which essentially, as we all know, um, have evolved in an environment that is essentially in a complaint, in a, a social herd, which is quite the antithesis of, of what we tend to uh, contain them in, whether it's a, a paddock or, or a stable. So we are looking at expanding our awareness of what buildings for horses can be tonight. And I'm going to look at drawing in the five domains and this idea of bringing this assessment tool into focus is to show that the, the potential of the five domains and horse architecture to marry in and create an assessment tool for creating positive experiences of horses is something that is really undervalued and utilised. And, and, and through our research and, uh, and bringing in all the gamuts of everything from thermo regulation to respiratory to behavioural science, that the five domains sits as an umbrella for assessing horse facilities. So we're going to talk through that a little bit further. Um, all within that, that whole idea of optimising positive and, and minimising our negative consequences for our horses. Okay, so yes, the simple act of containing horses in your traditional people-centric buildings, and by people-centric buildings I mean buildings that resemble buildings that possibly we could even live in. Uh, and if you look at many buildings throughout history in terms of stables, there's usually a reminiscence of what was happening domestically or agriculturally in the building environment. And 
I find that that is largely at odds with the horse's evolutionary needs. And that's where the problem starts. And so if we start to look at it from first principles, and for instance, this picture of these horses under the, the shelter of a tree, we can look at, okay, how are they using that tree? How are they standing? How are they lying? Um, are they using it for shading, for wind protection, for social separation? What are all the um, the, the gamut of possibilities that these animals are using shelter and how can we look at applying that understanding into a building itself. And we all love our animals. We are trying to do the best by them. No one intentionally or unwittingly uh, injures them or cause them harm. But what we find through traditional housing, uh, stabling and as well as your, everything from your round yards to quite often your enclosed arenas is that we're putting our horse's welfare at risk and but simply by doing um, that we can really negatively impact their performance so it's one of those things that if we we look at every aspect of the horse's biology uh, its size its temperament and of course you're getting different uh, characteristics depending on what the breed is and the individual animal's experiences um, and I guess that's where the challenge of, of architecture is but if we look at all those aspects and create an environment based simply on what the needs of that horse is and within that uh, directive we can create an environment that is more suited to them and therefore we might be able to limit the dust we might be able to reduce the boredom we might be able to create more even light so the horse's eyes can adapt, uh, create environments where horses can feed in a natural stature, look at creating environments where horses can scratch and rub and maybe even crib without having um, some detriment to their health. So these are, the, I guess, some of the aspects that we look at as architects in the problem solving essentially architecture is a problem solving exercise and what we tend to do then is bring in a substantial mass of evidence from current scientific studies to look at how that we can really accommodate the horse's needs but from a problem base so look at what's going wrong and how we can try and address that and apply that knowledge uh, and there's a wealth of information out there um, just to best mitigate it So here we have, this is a, a fabulous photo that Julie kindly sent me. And I really particularly like this one because we've got the, the mares and the foals in a, a bit of a social scene. And we've got them having some sort of refuge from the sun. So they're seeking shade, which is a, a primary concern in Australia. And if you look at the social circle, there's someone on the out on the, the right hand side, but there's also someone uh, sneaking in there uh, in the actual crook of the tree. And I think that tells a, a huge story and to create that amount of shade and, and option is a really important factor for when we're looking at simple paddock shelters so that not just one horse dominates. And I guess that gives you an idea of, of where we're coming from. And if you look at the other photo, which is a very traditional current stabling method, uh, the horse has got views outside. Um, so there's probably a bit of cross ventilation, but you couldn't get something more extremely different. Um, and and I, I kind of like these photos together because the, the um, construction company have even tried to take the colours from the natural environment to find something that they're trying to sit with the horse. And, and from all intents and purposes, it works practically, but does it really limit the horse's physiological and behavioural needs? We think it does. Um, and, and I guess in some of the ways that could be an obvious injury and reduced performance. This is my own horse that suffered an injury because of a paddock shelter's exposed concrete footing. You can see there because horse is moving around and it's eroding that there's some sort of um, sharp edge. Um, there's a bar there where it shouldn't be. There's horses kicked through the, the actual tin because that metal should not anywhere be near a kicking zone and so these little instances sometimes go without notice and this was well before I was an architect and, and it was just all part and parcel okay if there's an injury the horse the vet comes out and you, you deal with it but if we start to think about what that paddock shelter could be and how it could perform so this doesn't even happen um, I think that design from first principles is has a lot of merit and to this, to this example where we have a very um, common experience where horses are going to different events, this animal was here for two or three days at a, at a pony show, 
um, at a public uh, event um, establishment. And this horse's enrichment of its life was essentially limited to when it was taken out of the box. This little pony couldn't see much, it couldn't hear much. The ventilation would be fairly limited because it's well over at the height of the horse. Um, it was really contained in, in a very um, sad uh, environment from my perspective as an architect and, and as a welfare advocate. But this is something that happens day after day because this is what we've presented as options. And, and I guess from my point of view is I'm trying to work out well, why have they, why are they presented as options? What can we do to improve the options? And how do we improve that education of what our options can be for this horse's experience? Uh, now this is something I always smile when I see. And it, it's something that I, I include because yeah, it is quite quirky, but it's the whole idea of that if you, you have a look at this horse and, and if he was, I don't know, 10 centimetres more, it would have been a different story, hitting his, um, his head or his neck on the actual roof beam. But it's just that idea of these horses are volatile, they're amazing animals, that are, um, they've got their flight instinct happening, they've got um, a lot of adrenaline happening, and then we enclose them in an environment that might not necessarily cater for all parts of its um, behavioural repertoire. And we need to allow for these kind of moments, uh, and we need to create ease of handling and effective training and performance prevent potential um, so that it can actually uh, optimise the horse's relationship with us and not be to the detriment. Okay, so here we are bringing in the five domains model and we've got out the physical functional domains which obviously the architectural side of things fits in the environment and the environmental challenges are really important and how that if we have a negative, for instance, if a horse is hot, that it then is able to seek cooler environment so that there's opportunity for it to seek shade, maybe more ventilation or prevailing breezes. So that whole idea of freedom of choice is very important from an architectural point of view. And if we move into the behavioural domain, which is something we're going to focus on tonight, um, not necessarily so obviously connected to the environment to the architecture, but is something that has no lesser um, substance and importance to us and where we come from as architects. So we'll look at that a little bit closer now. So if you can see, uh, if we look at Horses South Australia's wonderful depiction of the, the five domains model here, and we concentrate on, on the last rectangle of behaviour, we look at all the exercise of agencies and how they can be impeded and everything from inescapable sensory impositions, choices markedly restricted, constraints on environment focused activity, constraints on animal to animal interactive activity, limits on threat of avoidance, escape, defence activity and limitations on sleep and rest which is critical. And then if you just think back to that, that photo I showed you of the horse in the, the stable at the competition, a lot of that stuff was apparent and it might not necessarily be considered when you put that horse in there, shut the gate and, and think it's got the right rugs on, it's got the right feed, it's got a bit of water and you leave it to be. But if we look at that in terms of its agency and, and what it, its freedom of movement and, and foraging and bonding and, and playing and, and novelty over those three days, it's really, it's, it's quite markedly um, deficient and particularly in terms of, of sufficient rest and sleep which is something that we are very concerned with in terms of where the evidence-based science is indicating how many horses are really uh, suffering from a lack of recumbent sleep and therefore their performance and their handling, their cognitive ability, everything is impaired um, and there's many reasons for that which we'll move into. So to look at environmental enrichment, uh, which is our focus tonight. Uh, I've picked out that as a, a starting block because it's not something that everybody is familiar with in terms of terms, but it's something that as architects, we try and incorporate in every aspect of the horse's experience of the built environment. So not just the stables or not just the paddock, but every part of it, looking at environmental, environmental enrichment. And so if we are to look at that, from a scientific uh, evidence point of view and where the, the research is pointing, we can see 
from the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums that it, it mentions that animals raised in enriched environments have a higher cognitive capacity than those from unenriched environments. Now, isn't that enough? Isn't that uh, enough motivation to create environmentally enriched uh, built structures, covered arenas and, and all the spaces in between for our horses. There's a huge amount of diverse studies out there in terms of reducing anxiety and increasing memory enhancement. Um, and, and it's great to see that uh, there's some of those studies coming through. And, and I know Horses and People magazine are a great advocate for some of that uh, publications, uh, which is wonderful. And there's a really interesting study for, of horses. They're in this 12 week program and they're even even seeing that there are personality traits and there's molecular changes in the horses that have the environmental enrichment program uh, if they're, they're involved in that program. And so that kind of uh, evidence to us shows that this is a really important and critical aspect of stable design that many people might not even have considered. And it, it, it's quite um, profound the effects and here we've got some considerations providing choice is number one vary the enrichment and so here I'm talking about all types of sensory enrichment so um, what the horse can hear what the horse can taste what the horse can smell what's under its feet uh, and and not just a, ma a matter of providing all that enrichment because we don't want to create an environment that's overstimulating and they they cannot um, find the capacity to rest or to be mentally uh, recuperating, we want to still be able to provide opportunities where maybe the activities are quiet, the way that the facilities are designed, that there are zones of the day where different um, social whether it's equine or, or people and, and all the management of a, a facility are, are carried through. And then there are moments where the stables are, uh, for want of a better word, quieter and ability for the horses to take rest. But a horse won't necessarily rest just because the space is quieter and uh, the activities have ceased. It's about creating an environment that they can feel content in. And by the word content, I'm talking about not an anthropometric content. It's more about that they're feeling that they're predators uh, and they're not at risk of having predators um, or aggression from other horses. They uh, have adequate food and, and water. Their comfort level is appropriate. They're not overheating or, or, or cold and they're able to maybe move out of prevailing winds. And so creating an environment, all, the, all of those aspects um, that attend to all of those aspects can be quite complicated. And, and um, there's not a one size stable that fits all, but it's a, it's a matter of looking at that variety of sensory input and, and creating um, some great tools to do that. And there's some really good um, uh, fittings in Europe. They've got some great back scratches, and I don't know if anyone's seen the, their wonderful rolls they're almost like what you find in a car wash and they put them in paddocks with cattle and they love to scratch on them and I think it's something that we could look at for our horses in enriching their lives and, and maybe they won't rub their head so much on the, on the feed um, bucket rail or, or, or damage the the pipes in, in stables uh, if they've got alternatives to, to scratch and lean and rub and, and bite so looking at all those aspects um, also looking at how we can create a horse to fulfill its full repertoire of natural behaviours and to be able to roll and lie down and, and a key way of doing this is to actually allow the horse to be able to see the floor outside because um, you can imagine if you were yourself rolling on a on a floor level and you couldn't see what was happening on the other side of that wall and particularly if you're an animal that was prone to, to flight um, we might not um, see that as a priority, whereas um, survival is. So they might stand up and have resting periods standing up. Whereas if we create an environment where they can see what's happening on the wall, like this, I mean, on the floor, like this mesh door here, it actually promotes rolling and horses lying because they're feeling safer. There's a, a sense of being able to see what's happening beyond their, their container, which is really a, just a, a small important point that can be really life-changing for the animals. And in regards to that though, it's a matter of safety, durability, 
um, and appropriateness of materials. Because you can see here's an, a stable below, very similar, but because the, the grade of the mesh was not as sufficient, uh, maybe there are other aspects at play here. I know there are both yielding stable, so it's not necessarily the type of horse, but it's it's all about that appropriateness and going to the nth degree to make sure that they're it's sitting best fit with the horse. Uh, and these are other little examples of enrichment. There's nothing like watching um, a little group of horses loafing around, and and this is uh, something that we try and create in all of our environments where horses can come together um, uh, socially relax together, sleep together, uh, rest, as well as uh, interact. And creating a simple space where you've got your sand and a very safe uh, enclosure is a simple way of uh, looking at providing this. And some people even use their sand arenas um, to create this environment. To On the, the other side here, we have some stables, a very open courtyard environment where the horses, although they need to be contained uh, within their individual stables as per the racing code. Uh, there is um, the scope for the animals to be involved in more of an external environment uh, and, and look at the activities that are happening, huge amounts of sunshine and, and ventilation, but it, it's, it's simply a matter of making it the environment as close to what we can physically uh, to how they evolved. And then overlaying all of that, so all of the domains, welfare assessment, um, the horse requirements, is the architectural assessment. And this is where we, we're bringing the first principles in. We look at what the activities that are going to be accommodated, the context, which is something that's huge, everything from what the authorities you know, say how we need to remove manure to how um, the building regulations control colours and materials and the, the lie of the land and prevailing winds and temperatures, financial investment, life cycle and future proofing. Like then for instance, it's no use creating a, an environment for horses. I think, uh, for instance, if you're looking at a uh, um, miniature horse stud that uh, no other animal could ever use, it, it's looking at maybe flexibility and adaptability, um, maybe stable walls can move in and out. There are different ways of creating walls and maybe some uh, walls, infill walls can be able to be seen by uh, smaller horses can see through as well as larger horses. So just looking at that life cycle and future proofing can sometimes encourage creativity in the architectural solution. And of course, there's appearance where, you know, as architects, that's one of the, the main thing people come to us and say, we want it to look like this or, or we don't want it to look like that. And, and I think that's really important in terms of celebrating the sense of horse space, but also looking at making sure that, that it ticks all our, our horse requirements and welfare. And of course, construction, which is very much linked to the appearance. And, but in terms of horse construction, even uh, we see many horse construction companies that have for years and years and years constructed paddock shelters, they're still looking at creating metal to the ground. And when horses are leaning and kicking and, and um, using it as a windbreak, that can something that is for us be really um, inappropriate. And it's just simply Matt, look, looking at every element and testing it, uh, looking how it stood the test of time in other examples, as well as um, other architectural typologies, agricultural industry, the, the cattle industry and, and things like that. So construction is a, a very important thing. Um, now to include here, uh, uh, a couple of different pictures of a stable or a barn in the US. And I think the, the reason, the primary reason for including this is because it is a really quite a spacious environment internally. And sometimes if you look at that internal shop up, shot at the top, it could almost be an outside um, dimension of space because there's a huge breezeway, huge access point, a lot of ventilation. Uh, it's got a, a roof that is quite high and uh, a, a lot of easy access. But what's important also is attached to the stables is a simple yard. The horses can choose to be in or be out uh, and there's a lot of choice. And so it's those little simple um, aspects of horse life that can really enrich their ability um, to pass the day and, and be happier and healthier. <laughs> the shot there I've got um, up on the top there with the hay bales, this is, a, I guess, an architectural design device where somebody who you know, thought to create 
an interesting way of uh, filling in a facade and storing hay at the same, same time. That whole facade is a hay storage. Um, and it looks quite effective in architectural photos. But for me, I don't know if I was that horse there uh, watching that hay and, and smelling that hay all day. I'm not sure if that would be um, a, a very settled uh, mental capacity to be in. So that's kind of why I've included that. Uh, and now we're moving to uh, a project that we've worked on in the Otways, something soon to be started and constructed. And this is a stable you can see on the, the right there, very low lying stable in a context that's very coastal, uh, very sensitive environmentally, and looking at creating a building that was very much in tune with the hub of horses that was going to be uh, accommodated. They were freely walking in, they were free, uh, free to eat, there was created a what we call a feeding wall where horses can put through their, their head and, and eat the hay without it being soiled um, or horses using their force aggressively to dominate the hay and it's a matter of being able to then uh, the people who were involved in the the project, the clients, their children being able to feed the horses safely. There was all those aspects. But in terms of the plan, um, which I might move on to the next one. Um, the horses come in through where you can see all those little dashed lines where it says transition surface. They come into the shelter and they're free to move in and through that shelter. But what's also is very important, there's an escape route so that the horses didn't feel like they were being um, dominated by any one animal of the, of the small herd and then they can move through. And there's areas for horses to seek shelter in different weathers as well as seek um, winter sunshine. And it's all about creating an environment that just you, you're thinking about moving through it and, and doing the, all the activities with your horses and what you experience three-dimensionally, which is, is quite critical. Uh, move on through. And then we've got this example here, which uh, again is in, in the US. And I think this is a really interesting aspect of facilities where architecture is definitely playing a part. These are quite um, prominent architects in um, North America. And there's great ventilation and aspects of views and horses have really interesting um, daily lives in terms of what they can see. Um, but then, there's, you know, architecture never 100% gets it right. And, and from buildings with the way of created and with what made wonderful roofs that are really high and and great for shading, but then maybe you know coastal winds and right, driving rain, bring rain right into the stable. And I guess this is an example of where I see that you know the aspect of that little horse on the end, Shetland or, or whatever its its um, breed is, it, it needs to arch its neck so it can see over. And so th these little aspects to look at really accommodating the horse's welfare and, and well-being, uh, we need to try and, and look at all the options and, and possibilities of how the stables are going to be occupied. So in conclusion, um, wrapping it up, I guess if we don't have a responsive design approach, uh, we can really compromise our horse's performance and welfare. And architecturally, this is something that we need to consider. It's not something that is obvious to many people. You know, people quite often when they come into one of our education series or my students at Marcus Oldham is like, what are we learning about architecture? What are we, you know, is it about how big a stable needs to be or, or what materials we can build? But no, it is so much more. It's about inspiring people to really optimise the, the health and well-being of our horses in all these environments uh, and creating the, the structures that are thoughtful and really responsive to each of their evolutionary needs. So that it's a new level of welfare uh, beyond the standard of minimum care, which is again uh, tuning into the, the five domains and, and looking at anthropomorphic ideals, uh, for instance, our own comfort levels and trying to look at the horse as a species and creating a very different set of criteria simply because, for instance, how the horse cools and heats itself compared to us, therefore, from first principles should end up with a very different building. But that is not always the case. And, and that's something that we need, we feel we need to think about a little bit more. 
So thank you so much for joining in. Um, really appreciate you taking an interest in our passion at Equitecture. Um, I particularly, I like to end on this slide and start on this slide. For, for me, it's a, it's a horse listing. He's got his ears out having a look through and, and he, this one um, can choose to be in the sun or he can choose to be in the, in the shade uh, and out of the prevailing breeze. And I think it's something that we is, is nice to, to finish on and, and in looking at just every aspect of our horses environmental interaction is uh, where we're coming from. So thank you very much. And I just want to end there with um, encouraging you to keep in touch. We've got um, Equitecture eBooks on today's topics. If anyone's interested, please message me on the Facebook page. We've got the my own, Leonie Lee, the Equitect one, as well as our Equitecture horse facility design one. Um, we could, we chat about all things horse facility design and I've got some stable walk and talk to us starting up there, which is some really interesting little informal videos on different aspects of stables. Uh, we've got a new feature article in Horses and People magazine out yesterday which is looking at context and horse welfare. So please um, have a look at that. And I've been invited to be a, an educator at Equitana this year, which is wonderful. I, I've only done Equitana Melbourne, so it's great to be flying over there. And uh, of course, our educational workshops and seminars. But the, our big news, I guess, is that we've got an online equine facility design module starting up on the 1st of September. So if anyone's interested in, in really investing in their horse's future welfare, uh, it's a matter of uh, getting some further information, we're starting to release that over the next week um, and hopefully really creating a difference to our horses day-to-day -day lives in where they spend most of their time. So thank you everybody.